webinar day. Um, I am Chris Irons, Strata Advisor with Heinz Legal, former Commissioner for Body Corporate and Community Management. With me this week is obviously not Frank Higginson, uh, but I'd like to welcome Madeline Harling making her debut on the Heinz Legal webinar series. Madeline, welcome to the webinar series. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Madeline Harling. I have been at Heinz since December 2020. I have been in the legal industry for about eight years and practicing for three. Um, two fun facts about me. I can move my ears up and down and I have a twin. <laughs> uh, we probably won't get you to do the ear thing today, Madeline. Uh, uh, headphones, uh, it's Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in, our, in our prep today, I clarified with Madeline, she is more than likely to be the good twin and not the evil <laughs> twin, which is good news for everyone. Um, look, Madeline's here today because it's fair to say she's acquiring a bit of expertise when it comes to our topic today, which is water ingress. Um, Frank is having a short webinar break. Uh, you'll no doubt see him again next week. Just uh, as always for the webinars, you can ask us questions live, so using the chat function on YouTube uh, and afterwards for that matter. Also, please don't forget to register for the webinar series. I can't believe that we have almost reached the end of June, which means that our July topics will be announced next week. By registering, um, that's how you get notified about what those topics will be and when. We've got some doozies coming up, suffice to say. Um, but yeah, back to this week, water ingress. So here's a fun fact for everyone. The word ingress comes from the 15th century Latin ingressus. You like that little accent I put on there? Ingressus means to go in and also gradi, which means to step or to go. And I think that's useful to bear in mind because that's pretty much what we're talking about today, which is the progress of water moving from one location into another. Um, that's easy to see in some cases. Sometimes you can actually have a visual of that. So say in a high rise, you can actually maybe see water leaking or dripping or even cascading in some cases. But it's not the only way, as I hope that you'll find out today. Um, so why are we bothering to do water ingress as a topic? Why is it a big deal? Um, it's actually a very obvious problem for some people, be it owners or bodies corporate. Uh, I actually think that one of the reasons why it's a big deal is because it's one of those maintenance issues where you have both visual and audio connection to the problem. You can see the water and you can also hear it uh, dripping as well. Um, so the combination of those two, I think, actually adds to the sort of emotive feeling about it. And the other side of it too is that when we buy a property, we don't expect it to be leaking. Uh, in fact, the opposite. We think that our property will be watertight, resilient, and able to resist the elements. And so when it does happen, uh, it's arguably just a bit more stressful and emotive than some other maintenance issues. Um, we can sort of debate that at another time, I suppose. Madeline, do you think that this is something that we're seeing more and more of? Um, definitely, especially judging by the inquiries that we are getting at the moment. Um, water ingress issues appear to be arising, especially as buildings are getting older and the impact of years of sometimes unknown um, water ingress issues come to light and or get worse. Um, there are also many new buildings that are experiencing issues, sometimes as a result of defecting building work. I think that one about new buildings is particularly difficult for some people to take because, uh, you know, if you buy something brand new, I think your expectations about what it will be are much, much higher than not something new. And I think that's particularly difficult for people to take. Madeline, what are some of the common consequences of water ingress? So obviously water leaking is um, one of the main ones um, internally and or externally. Um, there can also be multiple avenues of that water ingress which can get very frustrating um, and indicates the importance of identifying each avenue. Um, other consequences are obviously building damage um, including issues to roofs, mould, carpet damage um, and also concrete cancer can be an issue after prolonged water ingress and um, sometimes electrical problems. One of the other um, common consequences that we find is uh, loss of rent. 
Um, for example, if an owner or an occupier cannot live in the property due to water ingress issues or even the um, undertaking the remedial works during that process, um, there may be loss of rent claims. Um, in relation to that point, um, we really do recommend you seek legal advice in those instances. Yeah, uh, the, the process for doing something about a loss of rent claim is, is not as simple as you might think it would be. Yeah. I dare say that many people watching today are hoping for a very simple black and white answer about who is responsible for uh, order ingress situations. But uh, Madeline, as I hope people will come to understand today, not quite that simple, is it? No, it is not black and white at all, and it really depends on each circumstance. Um, so who is responsible depends on several things, in particular, where the water ingress is taking place and the cause of it. For example, whether it's occurring inside a lot or common property or sometimes both, um, and whether an owner or anyone else has done anything to cause or contribute to that cause of the water ingress. It also depends on whether the scheme is subdiv subdivided by way of a building format plan or standard format plan. Um, so one thing we will talk about today is um, the general responsibilities of the body corporate. So generally a body corporate must maintain common property in good condition, including to the extent that common property is structural in nature in a structurally sound condition. Where a scheme is created under a building format plan, there are additional maintenance responsibilities for the body corporate, including that the body corporate must also A, maintain in good condition roofing membranes that are not common property, but that provide protection for lots or common property, and B, maintain the following elements of scheme land that are not common property in a structurally sound condition, including foundation structures, roofing structures providing protection, and essential supporting framework, including load bearing walls. The body corporate is generally not responsible for maintaining fixtures or fittings installed by the occupier of a lot if they were installed for the occupier's own benefit. Despite an obligation the body corporate may have to maintain a part of a lot in good condition or in a structurally sound condition, the body corporate may recover the prescribed costs as a debt from a person, whether or not the owner of the lot, whose actions cause or contribute to, dam to damage or deterioration of that part of the lot. So they're the general, very general, broad um, obligations of the body corporate um, and are generally relevant to water ingress disputes, as well as the lot owner's responsibilities, um, which include, uh, for an occupier, sorry, of a lot, they must keep it, um, keep parts of the lot readily observable from another lot or common property in a clean and tidy condition. Um, and the owner of a lot included in the scheme must maintain the lot in good condition, except where it is the body corporate's responsibility to maintain it in good condition. And broadly speaking, um, an owner's responsibility to maintain their lot extends to keeping their tiling system in good condition. So I think what, what comes out of that discussion there, Madeline, on the one hand, you've got the body, comp body corporate responsible for X, and then you've got the lot owner responsible for Y, and in an ideal world, those two things would meet effectively or complement each other, you'd move forward on that. Problems arise when there is maybe some blurring of the lines between X and Y in that scenario. Um, and there are sometimes complicating factors and you outline some of those in that scenario as well. Uh, we've got a few questions already and we will uh, get to as many of those as we can uh, as we go along everyone. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for engaging everyone. Um, we'd be here all week, I reckon, uh, if we discussed every different type of water ingress, water ingress problems. Uh, Madeline, what are the common ones in your experience? Yeah, so we would be here all, all week. Um, to name a few um, common ones that we see are leaking balconies, leaking roofs um, and leaking planter boxes. Another common issue is a failure to properly waterproof the external parts of the scheme, including when undertaking maintenance works, which can result in water ingress if not done properly. For this webinar, however, um, I'll probably focus on leaking balconies, which in my experience um, can be caused or contributed by um, defective, failing or missing waterproofing membranes and or a failure to maintain tiling systems by lot owners. There can be several contributing factors to water ingress and it's important to try and identify that as it will impact on who is responsible to rectify it. Um, and in most cases, it is not a simple answer. Um, it is definitely not. Just before we move on, comment there that maybe the sound isn't what it mm -hmm. could be. Um, yeah, um, 
Seems okay for us it, here while we're talking. Um, uh, we'll see if we can make a few tweaks as we go along, everybody, but please bear with us if it's not 100% perfect at our end. Just to pick up on what you were saying there, Madeline, um, mm -hmm. there's a number, well, not even a number, there's a stack of adjudicators' decisions about water ingress and also about leaking balconies. Um, and the answer there, uh, and I think it's fair to say, Madeline, um, it's not simple and it's not straightforward, is it? Correct. No. Um, so, some of those adjudication orders go for many, many, many pages and you can see the effort that the adjudicator has to go through to get to the end result, given how difficult it is for everybody. Um, Madeline, what are some of the other considerations when it comes to water ingress? So just to name um, a, like just a couple of you, um, sorry, um, whether there is clear evidence that the work is required, um, such as installation of a waterproofing membrane, that was a relevant consideration in Galileo Towers, um, where an adjudicator said it was arguably unreasonable for the body corporate to undertake work or repair, to repair or replace the waterproofing membrane on any balcony without clear evidence of that need for that work. So um, just, uh, sorry, I'll jump in there, Madeline. Um, that, the link to that order will be posted, well, it's been posted now. Back to you, Madeline. Thank you. Um, another consideration um, is whether a waterproofing membrane was installed at the time of construction. Um, this was a relevant consideration in Sanctuary Gardens, um, which is another adjudicator's decision, um, where they did not require, where they did not consider a body corporate was required to repair a membrane if the balconies are constructed without a membrane. So I'm just chucking that one up as well, and it should be there right now. Um, another consideration is whether there is any evidence of continuing water ingress, which was a consideration in the matter of Evelina. And that's the last one which should be appearing on your screen any second. Um, it's really only a small sample of the number of orders that are there. My, I think our suggestion, wouldn't it, Madeline, is for people who are interested to get some more specifics to go to the websites that we've just put up the links there for and do a bit of research on those orders. You can search for particular terms. Um, you can put in the term balcony, for example. You can put in the term tiling. You can put in the term membrane or waterproofing and find a situation that's relevant for you. And then of course, Madeline, the reasonableness question kicks in, doesn't it? Yeah, so amongst all these considerations, you also have the overriding duty that a body corporate must act reasonably in, regard to, in regards to its functions, including in making or not making a decision. Similarly, a committee must act reasonably in making a decision as well. And I don't think there's a webinar that goes by where the question of reasonableness does not come up in one form or another. And it's the same in every situation. What's reasonable differs from case to case. Um, it's That's just how it is. Uh, you, and I'll, I'll use the analogy I always use. You might have two buildings side by side and for all intents and purposes, they are the same, built by the same developer, same number of lots, same number of floors, same painting, same everything. One design feature difference though, creates a world of difference in both of those scenarios. So that's why it's always got to be based upon each situation. And then Madeline, so we've got the actual water ingress issue itself, and then we've got the ancillary to the water ingress, don't we? Yeah, so um, another thing that can arise from water ingress issues, issues is having to pay for ancillary work. So for an example, um, if the body corporate is responsible for replacing or installing a waterproofing membrane, generally tiles um, will need to be removed. The body corporate may then have to foot the costs of replacing those tiles. However, this is not always the case. Um, in circumstances, for example, where an owner has failed to maintain the tiles and they need to be replaced, or has installed a layer of, layer of tiles on top of tiles, which actually appears to happen quite often, um, this cost may be borne by the lot owner and not the body corporate. However, it does go on a case-by-case -case consideration and there is no blanket answer. We might shoot just a couple of questions before continuing a bit further. Uh, not a question, but a comment uh, from Chris Ross. Thanks for tuning in. 
Uh, fun fact, apparently in Iran, one must replace the waterproof membrane on the strata building every 10 years by law. Fascinating. Um, I think that's our first mention of Iran in this webinar series too. Um, question or questions from Neil. Thanks for tuning in, Neil. Uh, Neil's question, we own a top level unit and also the accessible roof area. Uh, we have water ingress issues from the roof into our apartment, mainly at roof drain and penetrations. And then the PS, is the roof all the body corporate's responsibility or is there a demarcation line? That is a fantastic question, Neil. Um, you would probably have figured out by this point, you're not gonna get a simple answer to that one. Um, generally, very, very, very generally speaking, Neil, the roof would typically be a body corporate responsibility, but uh, it depends upon what arrangements are in place. Um, uh, exclusive use may play a part. Uh, what maintenance has or, or has not been done over a period of time. Um, it's very, very, um, very, very difficult to give you a straight answer on that. It will also depend upon what uh, plan of subdivision applies uh, and uh, I would be suggesting to you Neil if you haven't done so already drop us a line and we'll see if we can assist you further with some actual legal advice. Happy to say that apparently the sound issues have cleared up a little bit though that's excellent news. Uh, question down here from Rebecca. Rebecca thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, we have water penetration into a bulkhead located on the patio, gutters are not leaking or overflowing, damage from rain, would this be owner of body corporate cost to repair? Very difficult to say so based on that information, Rebecca, there would be a bit more detail required uh, to give any kind of info about that one. Um, again, I suggest if that's an issue for you, uh, you might wanna drop us a line uh, because that might require a bit more detailed advice, I would suggest. Uh, Alexandra, uh, does this webinar cover water leaks from fixtures and pipes as well as water ingress from outside? Well, the webinar is about ingress uh, itself. Um, so feasibly, uh, ingress could come from fixtures and pipes. Madeline, would you agree? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, so what we're talking about, I suppose, Alexandra, to answer your question, we're talking about very generally about the ingress issue. And then there might be some application for your particular circumstances as well. All right, let's continue. And we might get a few more questions as we go along. Um, everyone who watches the webinar knows that uh, Frank and I try and give you a bit of a step-by-step -step guide on how to solve a problem. And, and I think that's particularly relevant here today, given the number of times we've said it's case by case and it's never straightforward. So we're gonna try and give you an extremely simplified method of going about resolving a water ingress problem that might be experiencing at your body corporate. So step one, being aware that there is actually a problem and that might have everybody watching this going, duh, uh, I know there's a problem. It's actually not necessarily the case. Uh, I mean, a good example of that might be if the lot, say for example, if we're talking from the perspective of the lot owner, if the lot is not occupied for a period of time, or maybe the lot is occupied by a tenant and the tenant is in and out, maybe they're fly in, fly out workers, who knows? But if you're not there to see and hear the problem develop, then the problem develops without it being noticed. So step one is being aware. That's also an issue for the body corporate as well. If the body corporate is doing proactive maintenance and exercising its maintenance obligations proactively, and a lot of bodies corporate I know have a proactive maintenance schedule that they follow for, for that purpose, then hopefully they'll get on top of it sooner rather than later. So that's step one, actually becoming aware of the issue. Uh, step two, is there an obvious or simple location of the ingress? Um, the answer is, Madeline, not that often is it that obvious, is it? No, and there can be multiple avenues as we discussed earlier. Um, I've come across quite a few matters where they've come across one avenue, fix that, and the water is still coming through. Um, so that just generally, um, emphasizes the importance of identifying all avenues of that water ingress. 
which leads very nicely to our step three. Um, yeah. If step two is no help to you, and it probably won't be in a lot of cases, that identifying to the naked eye is going to be very difficult. Step three requires you to get some kind of expert advice to identify, doesn't it, Madeline? Yeah, so we would um, recommend um, an advice from an engineer or other building expert. Um, this could involve some form of testing to help identify the avenues of that water ingress, including flood testing using water and or dyed water and some level of invasive investigation. And a lot of the time, the, the issue that pops up at this step would be the issue of cost. Uh, who pays for it? Who pays for that expert report? And also, uh, I suppose, some people resenting actually having to spend money on doing so. Um, I suppose what I'd be saying, though, is if there's going to be a dispute about responsibility for damage caused by water ingress, you're going to need the expert opinion at some point to back up your case. So it ha you might as well get onto it. As for who uh, pays for it, it really depends upon the circumstances. Uh, if I own a lot, for example, and I see that there's water ingress uh, and I'm concerned about what's going on, uh, I might decide that it isn't the most expedient way for me to do things to get the report myself, so to pay for the report myself, or to pay for the advice myself. Equally, from the body corporate's perspective, they might think it a reasonable decision to make to pay for the advice. It really does depend upon the circumstances. And the legislation does not drill down to, you must pay here, you must pay here. It doesn't quite do it that way. The next step, step four then, is about decision making, isn't it, Madeline? Yeah, so a decision needs to be made about who is responsible, for example, a lot owner or body corporate or another third party at times. Um, and depending on who is responsible, further decisions to be made, including whether the body corporate decides to rectify, not rectify and or commission further expertise to get quotes to rectify the damage and make funding arrangements if necessary. Um, if it were the body corporate, then appropriate motions would need to be resolved and there are several considerations in that regard, including considering the thresholds and spending limits. Um, and just these are just general steps as well, just to clarify. Absolutely. There, this is this is not legal advice. This is being practical about working your way through the situation. I think you make a really good point just then, Madeline, about um, further reports uh, or commissioning further advice. It might be the case that you start off with one advice um, and then it's quite appropriate for the other side to get their own advice. But of course, you may then have a situation where advice one says body corporate responsible, advice two says, no, 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 owner responsible. That might be when a further piece of advice has to be commissioned at that point too. So it might not simply be that you get one advice and that's the end of it in this scenario. There might be multiple points where multiple pieces of advice are needed. And that actually leads very nicely to the final step, doesn't it? Which is step five, actually implementing it. So you've gotten up to the previous step four, some decisions have been made. So either the decision has to be implemented and by implementing, we might mean the work gets done. Or uh, if the decision is not what you and I want it to be, it's disputing that decision. So, for example, the body corporate has made a decision that they will not pay for works, that they don't consider themselves responsible for the water ingress. The onus is then back on the lot owner to dispute that. And that would typically go to the commissioner's office to be resolved at that stage. Um, but not in every case, by the way, um, that uh, loss of rent issue that we talked about before, that's something that would typically not go to the Commissioner's Office to be resolved. Madeline, we've talked a lot about generalities today, but if there is one takeout that you would give people from today's discussion, what do you reckon that would be? I would say get on the front foot. Start early, um, as water ingress can cause a lot of damage. I would emphasise and second that one as well. If you if you see or you hear the leak or you become aware of the water problem, um, it probably is human nature to want to sort of avoid it or pretend it's not happening. Uh, but 
we think that that's not the right call. You need to act upon it before it escalates and gets a lot worse a lot more quickly. Um, we had a few more questions come through as we were talking. Uh, William, thanks for tuning in. Are you going to deal with the vexed issue of flexible hoses? Well, we can deal with it now. Um, so I, I remember doing a seminar not that long ago with an insurance broker who told me that water damage claims were probably the number one claim uh, in body corporate world. And a lot of the time, our flexible hoses were, if not fully to blame, then partially to blame. Um, one of the issues, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert in this field, but again, from my sort of involvement in some of these matters, is that sometimes both the body corporate and the owner have an expectation that the flexible hose will last a lot longer than it actually does. So um, if you do have a flexible hose, uh, it comes back to that maintenance issue. If it's, whether you're the body corporate or the owner, there are details, uh, there are maintenance responsibilities that you have to carry out. If you're carrying them out in a proactive, reasoned way, that lessens the chance of something happening. And the same applies for flexible hoses as well. Um, Sheena, thanks for tuning in. Hi, if an owner contributes to tiles lifting by gurneying tiles on their balcony and the membrane is damaged, can they be requested to contribute to repairs? Well, quite possibly they can be. Uh, it depends on the circumstances, I think. Um, the general, and again, very general rule of thumb is that if I have contributed to the problem, then it's expected that I will be contributing to the solution. But it really depends upon what has happened up to that point as well. So it's possible, Sheena, it's possible that that's the case. Uh, and Lucy, thanks for tuning in. How about toilet overflowing due to block sewerage outside the unit? Um, Again, it's about a maintenance responsibility there, Lucy. So if the maintenance responsibility is with the body corporate and it can be shown that they did not maintain that uh, common property appropriately, and then that's led to a problem for the individual in their lot, then it would be expected that the body corporate would probably, and I stress probably, be responsible. Slightly different in this case as well, uh, when you're talking about um, anything of that nature, you might actually be getting into whether or not there's some kind of urgent circumstances there as well, and whether you are um, a tenant or an owner as well. The different, different scenarios which come to play. We've come to almost the end, Madeline. Um, look, I think the wrap up today is not it? Uh, uh, for those people who sort of are hoping for black and white answers, I hope that you've come to the end today realising that that's not quite the case, is it? You, there's a bit of work to do to get to the end result, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it can, it can be a long time, which is why we stress that get onto the front foot point as soon as you can. As we say, next week is July, which is a new set of topics. We've got some good ones coming up. Uh, and again, don't forget to register for those uh, as they come up. But for now, Madeline, you survived your debut <laughs> seminar. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure everyone will see me again soon. I'm sure they will too. Uh, you'll definitely see me again soon, everyone, like <laughs> it or not, because I'll be here next week and I'm pretty sure Frank uh, will have returned from his webinar sabbatical by then. Uh, otherwise, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. You. Bye.